welcome back. Today we salute 2018. And as we did last year, we will present you with our impression of the most important items of progress that have been made in the year 2017. Now, there have been many fronts of progress in the neurosciences, uh, and it's difficult to make a selection. However, we believe that we should dub 2017 the year of the brain circuit. And I will give you a whirlwind tour of 10 papers that highlight the importance of brain circuitry and the dramatic progress that has been made over the last year or so. We will range from the microcircuitry of the cortex to the um, predictive model of brain processing, namely the Bayesian brain. We will then proceed to the uh, default mode network and its implications for processing of automatic thoughts and action. We will then go on to other items such as a clinical, a clinically important items such as how do two brains interact? For example, in the setting of um, the, the issue of um, uh, personality disorders, which are often characterized by a failure of uh, interpersonal communication. We will eventually end up with schizophrenia and uh, show that some circuit abnormalities in schizophrenia predict the occurrence of psychosis as well as the severity of psychosis. But before we get started, I'd like to give you my view of a um, model of the brain circuitry that you and I come with that has been given to us by evolution. So let's begin somewhere here. And let's call this the spinal cord, which eventually winds up in the brainstem. The brainstem goes into the midbrain, and all this we share with dinosaurs, which are extinct, of course, and with reptiles, which are still around. So evolution did not design the brain from scratch to give you a beautiful mind, but rather evolution patches on top of what it was already has done, some additional modules. So the additional module then that was patched onto the old reptilian brain is called the cortex. Now, in between the cortex and the uh, midbrain is something called the hippocampus. Now I'm going to patch this here on the very top because a case can be made that the hippocampus is kind of the final station for signals to be distributed as they come in from the periphery. So here we have the cortex. Now, the cortex itself is a structure that is highly intricate. It's uh, folded in many different ways, so it can be stuck into a skull that can only be expanded so much because of limitations of the birth canal. But all cortices of mammals, from the mouse to Einstein, look very, very similar under the microscope and can be difficult to differentiate. Namely, the cortices are constructed of six layers. And one of our papers will talk about the function of the different layers. And the cell populations in these different layers is quite typical. We usually have pyramidal cells, which are big, clunky cells, ex um, extending processes in layer five. We have granule cells in layer three, for example, and there is a microcircuitry in place, the so-called cortical microcolumn. The cortical microcolumn is uh, preserved by evolution. The microcolumns of the mouse and man are quite identical almost. 
And furthermore, the microcolumns in the different cortical regions, such as visual cortex, auditory cortex, uh, somatosensory cortex, motor cortex, and frontal cortices, are quite alike. And this has raised the suspicion that perhaps the algorithm implemented in the cortices are all identical. So you receive input from the world by different energies that are being tapped, for example, photons from light sources, sound waves, um, proprioceptive input from your inner ear, um, somatosensory input from your skin. All these are then channeled via the thalamus into the cortex. However, once um, the energy has been transduced, for example, once a photon has been absorbed in the retina, there is no more that can be done about it because now traffic is all digital. There's no more second transduction. Everything that happens from now on is a digital processing which happens in the six layers of the cortex. And we will address this in further detail in one of the papers that we're going to be talking about. Now, the cortex is 80% of the brain's weight but only perhaps a third or so of the neuronal population. The cerebellum, which is a highly organized repetitive microchip of a certain kind, uh, controlling movements, has more neurons than the cortex. However, you don't need a cerebellum to be conscious. So it is believed that neurons in the cortex eventually drive the emergence of consciousness. Now, what about the midbrain? In the midbrain are a number of evolutionary ancient structures, such as the ventral tegmental area, which is your main dopaminergic input into the cortex. We have the substantia nigra, dopaminergic input into the movement centers. We have the dorsal raphe, which gives us serotonin, 5-H, T. And we have the locus ceruleus, which gives us norepinephrine. So these are ancient, evolutionarily uh, designed structures that come upward from the midbrain into the cortex and drive what's going on. They are so-called neuromodulators. And if you didn't have them, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning without dopamine. Nothing makes sense. The world is gray and will easily turn to ashes. You cannot move. Nothing will happen much in your world. So these ancient systems are designed to make your organism move, interact with the world, get interested in things, learn from pain, learn avoidance and approach. All these things are in ancient evolutionary structures. Now the hippocampus, I mentioned before, integrates much of the sensory input and can be put on top of the hierarchy, really. But then the hippocampus does an additional trick. Namely, it supports something called episodic memory. We remember where we were yesterday, what it looked like. It allows us to find our car in the parking lot. It allows us to find our way back home. And if you have damage to the hippocampus, such as an Alzheimer's disease, for example, one of the earliest symptoms is that you cannot find your way around and you cannot find your way home if you have wandered off from your house and your relatives are frantically looking for you. So here then is a breakdown of the basic structures. Now, what does the cortex actually do? Does it process all the information continuously or does it build models of things that, has, that it has encountered before? And of course, the answer is B. The cortex is a model builder, builder par excellence. It builds models of your body. If you have a particular stroke, you may not recognize that your left leg belongs to you. And you ask the physician to remove this leg because it's alien to you. Now, the physician can argue with you as much as he wants to. That is, your leg looks attached to you. You can no longer identify this leg as yours. 
because the model that uh, prior to the stroke incorporated your leg has been damaged and the leg is no longer yours. So you build a model of your body. Likewise, there's evidence you build a model of yourself. And of course, you build a model of the world. So rather than reconstruct the world every second of the day, you rely on the existence of so-called priors, prior models that you already have laid down. And what your cortex is looking for are any signals that deviate from the model already existing. That is the so-called Bayesian brain model of brain function. Only the, the error correcting terms are transferred up to the hierarchy into the cortex and are being dealt with as alarming or novel systems that are newsworthy items that should be paid attention to. In our previous uh, New Year's Day presentation of 2016, we made a great deal of the Bayesian brain and I encourage you to revisit this talk. We will include this into a new free lecture series of New Year's Talks by Behavioral Health 2000 and you can easily access this after you're done with this video. So let's get to our first talk in our whirlwind tour of brain circuitry. This talk is about the microcolumn structure of the neocortex. Now it's written by Jeff Hawkins who is with Numenta, a company in Redwood City in Silicon Valley in the US. Now Jeff Hawkins is a computer guy. He became very interested in neuroscience because he felt that artificial intelligence was at a dead end. That we needed to do neuromorphic computing. We needed to learn how does the cortex do it? How does the cortex compute things and then use those principles in the construction of artificial intelligence? And here are the columns that we have talked about and you can see there are input layers that change as you move your fingers up and down the cup. So the internal model of the cup already pre-existing in your cortex uh, will be triggered and it will examine the incoming signals and see is this a typical cup or is it unusual? Is it hot or cold? Um, does it fit into my hand? Uh, this is very important in artificial intelligence when a robot is trying to grab a sensitive item and move it from location A to location B. And here you see the pyramidal neurons and the idea of feedback. Namely, uh, the incoming sensory signal, the volume of information, is um, uh, examined by feedback signals that arise from prior information in the cortex and a comparison is being made and only novel signals or error signals are being propagated into the cortex. In the next slide there is the idea of sparse coding. Namely, you don't need to represent every single millimeter of the cup surface in order to compare it with your internal model. Rather, only uh, select signals that are sufficient to remind you of the model that's already pre-existing will be propagated in the hierarchy. And this sparse coding make, makes for extreme efficiency. Uh, with very few neurons you can code 40,000 or more items uh, that otherwise would have been unimaginable. So sparse coding and the column structure of the cortex lent themselves for high density computation. In the next slide I introduce you to a group from Switzerland. Now this is Henry Markram's group and he is building a supercomputer program called Blue Brain. This project has received quite a bit of criticism because it's very expensive. The European Union, Switzerland and many other donors have contributed to this and this group is running uh, supercomputers in Lausanne, Switzerland, as well as in Geneva. And what they're trying to do is nothing less but to totally model in silico, in other words, in a computer, a functional brain. Now they have begun with cortex, specifically 
with a cortex of rats of 14 days of age. This work has been going on for quite some time because the modeling is very detailed. They use the Huxley equation of nerve conduction uh, and other uh, hosts of differential equations that go into the model and are fed into the computer. Only a supercomputer can handle this kind of modeling. But eventually they have arrived at modeling uh, a neuronal microcolumn from the cortex. In addition to that, they have noticed that mathematics can be applied in this modeling, specifically a mathematics um, that is involved in mapping of geometrical structures. It's called algebraic topology. And I will show you in the next slide what this is about. So here you see a uh, microcircuit in the cortex and here are the different connections. And it is noted that if you make a drawing of impulse flow, so you model both the structure of the circuit as well as the direction of the neuronal flow or discharges. Where do the electrons actually go? You can see that neurons form so-called clicks. Certain neurons just are wired together and work together. And you can see how this wiring is quite intricate here. And uh, you can use a mathematical model to clarify the situation. There's just no way that you can record from tens of thousands of neurons in one, in one microcolumn in order to find every single differential equation. So you need to live with some abstraction. And that is what's done here. Now, if the model that comes out of the math duplicates sufficiently faithfully the behavior, the emergent behavior of the neuronal microcolumn in the cortex, then you know you're onto something. And you don't have to model every single neuronal connection. But you can use principles obtained from the model to derive some other ideas as to what is the, neur the neuronal code that supports what is the algorithm that drives the microcircuitry in the cortex. And here you see some more clicks. Now they come in a whole bunch of different forms depending on how the signal migrates. Here is a six simplex, namely six neurons that are connected in various different ways. Here is a seven simplex. And then here is the abstract drawing. And the um, algebraic topology not only takes into account the structure of this assembly of neurons but also the direction of impulse flow and it's noted that in the middle seems to be something like a cavity where there are no connections. The math is such that the connections flow around and these cavities have a great deal of predictive power. So, for example, here a prediction was made by recording from a number of neurons and look at the simplex complexity that can be predicted from the recording. And here it's a reconstruction from the mathematical model done in a supercomputer. And you can see the astounding agreement of the two items. So, it appears that the in silico brain circuitry that the group in Switzerland is doing is able to predict important features of um, calculations done in uh, neuronal circuitries in cortex. Okay, let's leave the uh, microcircuitry of the cortex behind and look at a larger issue, namely the predictive nature of processing in the brain. There is a bandwidth problem. We cannot possibly process all the information hitting us in our ears, eyes, nose, skin, proprioception and, and otherwise in real time. We don't have the bandwidth and it is not even necessary. If you invoke the predictive coding framework that we have discussed at great length in the 2016 New Year's lecture. Now the question always was what, what is the experimental evidence for this a reasonable model that seems to be making a lot of sense on the surface. 
And so last year, 2017, this paper came about and we were quite excited about it and gave a talk about it. But here is a quick review. Namely, if you flash a light over the retina, an area of V1 will respond. So here is the migrating light and you can see here with fast MRI in V1 you can show that the retinotopic organization that is preserved from retina to V1 is preserved and you can see the signal moving here in a time sequence. Now astoundingly once V1 has learned that a signal in this location is likely to be followed by signals here, you only need to give the initial signal and you get so-called preplay. In other words, your V1 circuitry guesses that the next instance will be another uh, dot appearing in V1 in certain positions and preplays in a time compressed manner the signal that is anticipated. So this is then a direct neuronal presentation of the predictive nature of the brain when it comes to processing of sensory input. There are great implications to this and in further lectures we will discuss some more of these items. I want to remind you we have an entire lecture series on the Bayesian brain that is very well worth reviewing as this item is becoming more and more prominent both in neuroscience as well as in psychiatry. Okay, let's move to another circuit, namely the one in the fusiform area of the temporal lobe. Now this has been known for a long time to be an area involved in face recognition. If you have a stroke in this area, you will suffer from prosopagnosia. You can no longer recognize faces. You can't even recognize your own face in the mirror. So there seems to be a dedicated circuit in the temporal cortex that supports this critical function. There's nothing more important uh, for a social animal like us to be able to recognize our kin, our family, our friends, our foes, and, uh, and analyze their emotional reactions in order to take appropriate social actions uh, that fits the situation at hand. So here is a lady by the name of Doris Zhao. She is at Caltech and she has done an incredible job in showing that there is a neuronal code that is quite different from the face recognition code in artificial intelligence in the sense that only a couple of hundred neurons in face recognition areas here medium and anterior fusiform face recognition area are sufficient to not only encode a face but also to recode. You can take the neuronal impulses from this area and recreate the image if you have the algorithm which you have found if you follow Dr. Zhao's technique. So here then is the breakdown. There are parameters such as shape, and uh, appearance parameters that are put into uh, the equations. <coughs> it turns out that a kind of 50 dimensional linear equations are required, but that's a far cry from like millions and millions of models that you need to look at in artificial intelligence. And you come up with a definite recognition of the face that you can also reconstruct faithfully. Let's move on from the face recognition area in the fusiform gyrus to the mystery of the default mode network. We have discussed the default mode network in prior lectures, particularly in reference to meditation. It is that network in the center of the brain involving structures such as the medial frontal cortex, the uh, precuneus, and um, the anterior cingulate gyrus as well as uh, aspects of the insular cortex that can be turned down in the meditative state. And the default mode network has been accused of driving something called mind wandering, uh, where we are distracted from the task at 
hand, if you focus on a math problem, the default mode network will progressively calm down. If you are in the scanner, minding your own business and thinking whatever you want to think about, your default mode network will go haywire and become very active. Now the default mode network is only a small part of the total cortical area. However, it consumes most of the energy that the cortex consumes. About 20% of the oxygen that you inhale is being burned by the brain and in particular by the default mode area by doing just nothing, just sitting in your chair. If you engage in a very demanding task such as playing a Beethoven sonata or trying to learn uh, the equations of general relativity, there is not much of a further increase in brain oxygen consumption. So what is this default mode network doing with all this energy? Energy is expensive. And why has evolution created the system when it's not clear what it's really all about? So the next paper comes up with an idea, perhaps it is critically important in processing routine types of information that we already understand quite well and don't, we don't want to pay attention to, but that still need supervision. And the experiment here is to use the Wisconsin card sorting test. This is a very interesting test. I show you a number of four cards and then present you with a fifth card. And I ask you, does it belong? Yes or no? And depending on the sorting principle that I have in mind, but that I didn't tell you about, the answer you give is either correct or incorrect. So I can ask you to sort for shape, in which case you're okay here, or I can ask you to sort for color. So these are two different sorting mechanisms. Or finally, I can ask you to sort for number, namely number one and number one. So you don't know this, but you can discover this by doing a few trials and you finally catch on. Say, okay, you want me to sort by shape. All right, so you get a bunch of those correct. And then I, I change the sorting paradigm on you without necessarily telling you. And bam, you get a bunch of wrong answers until you hit on the next sorting principle. And then again, you get a bunch of answers correctly. Now, if you do this task in a scanner and you view what's going on in the default mode network, you can see the reason that the default mode network might be involved in automatic processing. So here is the so-called acquisition phase. This is when you figure out what is the sorting principle. You acquire the information to perform the task accurately. And you can see why areas of the brain are being activated. The frontal eye field, the inferior parietal cortex, uh, visual cortices, of course. The whole brain basically lights up and you need to figure out what is going on. Once you got it figured out, though, everything calms down. And it's only the default mode network, which you know contains the posterior cingulate gyrus, some prefrontal cortical areas, all medially located. So this is an ingenious experiment which points to the automaticity of performing a task that we don't want to spend much energy on because we already got it. However, it also, of course, invites the mind-wandering part, where we already got it too, and we um, spend time in going over things that should already have been settled. So the default mode network by no means has been totally elucidated at this point, a very important circuitry in the brain. Okay, finally, to that paper that probably was the most hopeful and exciting for many of us in 2017 coming from the Max Planck Institute for uh, Social uh, Neuroscience in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, Tanya Singer is the main author. <clears throat> she is, by the way, the daughter of uh, Wolf Singer, who is another very famous uh, neuroscientist uh, 
who was at the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt for brain research. This is his daughter, it is found out recently. So this group then set about to prove once and for all whether meditation has any influence on cortical plasticity and changes brain structure. So they recruited about 300 plus people from the street and taught them various ways of meditation. So these involved um, training episodes of either first affective training, namely uh, empathy and compassion training, or focusing your attention training in a, a counterbalanced order. And this went on for months and months and months. A very tightly controlled study. This, in fact, is the study that puts the nail in the coffin of any doubt that meditation has very powerful effects on brain structure and brain functions. So in the next slide we see what happens. And you can see that if you don't meditate at all and you wait nine months or so, there will be a decrease in cortical thickness. And this is normal. As we age, our cortical thickness decreases. Now what is astonishing is that this happens within a nine-month time frame, a rather disturbing uh, finding. However, in the meditative people, for example, presence meditation, which is good old attention focusing meditation, you can see large areas of frontal and medial frontal structures which are enhanced. And in affect, concentration, and perspective taking, which is theory of mind, imagining what it's like to walk in somebody else's shoes, also enhance selective area of the cortex. So this is a very powerful finding because it points to the idea that if we expose children, for example, or young people to this kind of training, we may create a cohort of humans that are more empathic, compassionate than the forebears and may perhaps in time change the fate of the planet. In the next slide we go on to um, a theme we have discussed before in 2016, New Year's Day as well, namely uh, psychedelics. We have shown that psychedelics have powerful uh, effects on neuronal um, connectivity in the brain, namely psilocybin has been shown to decrease the activity of the default mode network. Now in this study the researchers looked at complexity complexity being an indicator of consciousness. In fact, there is a theory <clears throat> that has been uh, propagated by Giulio Tononi uh, that invokes complexity as one of the indicators of the emergence of consciousness. So in this study then, the uh, magnetic encephalographic signal was used because magnetic signals are very fast. You can follow the time course very rapidly after infusing, infusing, infusing uh, compounds and you can see uh, what happens to the EEG complexity. And complexity can be analyzed by something called the ZIF, left ZIF algorithm. Lempel ZIF algorithm. This is an algorithm which is used in compressing audio or video files and then at the other end you can restore the original file uh, with, that, with some loss perhaps. We don't need to go into the details just to tell you that uh, the number you can produce by these matrices is a direct index of the complexity of the signal that you send into the algorithm. And in the next slide you can see that all these compounds increase complexity. Ketamine does. By the way, ketamine has just been shown in the S-ketamine form uh, to be an adjunct in the treatment of depression in conjunction with classical antidepressants. When inhaled nasally, you take a sniff of S-ketamine and you're likely to get better faster. So increase in complexity in the EEG, same is true for LSD and psilocybin. So if complexity is a hallmark of consciousness, then these drugs may indeed produce an enhanced form of consciousness. 
In the next slide, let's go on. And let's talk about borderline personality disorder. Now, we have looked at um, brain circuitry in one brain. Why not look at two brains at the same time? Borderline personality disorder is a problem that is interpersonal in nature. Patients will overvalue people and then suddenly change their mind and uh, cut the doctor down to size. You're the best doctor I ever had and you are just totally worthless. There's an instability in um, assessing and maintaining a model of the other that is stable to perturbation. So in the next slide, I'll show you where this idea comes from. It comes from uh, neuroeconomics. If I put two people in MRI machines, they can be quite a distance apart and do something called hyperscanning. I can have them play a, uh, a game, um, a uh, game for money, a neuroeconomics game and look at their brain wave and the brain activity at the same time as they make decisions in economics that uh, either are cooperative or adversarial with the other partner that is scanned at the same time. So this idea was then adopted by researchers in psychiatry and they found that yes there is a region namely the temporal parietal junction. That area that we have previously talked about that supports theory of mind that can be isolated in a borderline personality patients as the area that can be assayed for correlation with a partner. In the next slide I'll show you the result. You can see this happens the correlation to non-paired folks. Here we pair chronic borderline personality people with healthy controls and here we have relapsed borderline personality patients, in other words, chronic patients uh, with healthy controls, and here we have healthy controls as the standard. So you can see healthy controls have a lot of correlation. When they are linked together in MRI machines, they synchronize uh, in response to certain interactions that they might have. Their brains uh, vibrate together. That's how we know that we got through to somebody else. Our theory of mind circuit uh, resonates with the theory of mind circuits of our interlocutor or the person that we are in love with, etc., etc. However, as you go to the borderline personality spectrum down, you can see that in borderline personality disorder, there is a disturbance in the ability to resonate together with somebody else. And here there is a correlation between the, uh, the, the clinical uh, traumatic questionnaire intensity. Borderline persons frequently, if not uniformly, have trauma in their past. And the trauma score here correlates with the neuronal coupling within pair correlation score. So, in other words, there is a validity to this predicting poor coupling in the theory of mind area according to how much trauma you have experienced. So, maybe we're coming to a psychiatry now of looking at two brains, perhaps even more together, being analyzed in meaningful interactions. Now, machine learning has made an experience a number of times in our lectures and you can bet in the next few years machine learning technology will play an ever increasing role in psychiatry and neuroscience. There are so many signals to analyze that come from the brain and clinical examination that it's very difficult to sort through what all these signals mean. Machine learning is excellent in sorting through a lot of matrices, a lot of items and coming up with patterns that are significant and can be extracted. So here the idea was, can we predict suicidal ideation uh, in young people who have, pr have been prone to suicidal ideations in the past? And it turns out that there are certain brain areas. If you read a list of words, uh, death, uh, depression, and other words to these folks, 
uh, that certain brain areas will light up predictably. They form stable clusters, stable voxels that can be used in this kind of analysis. So the suicidal folks have responses in these areas. And in the next slide, this is what happens. So these are dis the discriminatory areas that light up reliably when contrasting uh, suicidal group membership and non-suicidal group membership. There's some frontal areas here, some midline structures here. Okay, now what does this really mean? Does this really have any predictive relevance? In the next slide, I'll show you, yes, indeed. You can predict who will attempt suicide by looking at these signals. So this machine learning paradigm separates with almost 100% accuracy the suicide attempters from the non-attempters. So this then promises to be a very powerful tool to use machine learning to predict who is at the highest risk, perhaps, of uh, experiencing such intense suicide ideations that an attempt might be in the offing. Now, in the last set of slides, we go to schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia has been examined a number of times um, in uh, circuitry analysis, but this is a particularly uh, amazing study looking at the connectivity of hippocampal, basal ganglia, and midbrain circuitry. As I told you, the midbrain contains the dopaminergic ancient circuitry that drive motivation, but also something called salience. And can we look at folks at risk for very high, at very high risk for psychosis and see whether the circuitry might be abnormal? And in fact, we can, and we can identify certain areas of abnormal connectivity in the ultra-high risk group that um, can differentiate this group from normal controls. And furthermore, this abnormal connectivity of the midbrain, midbrain is um, the, the dopamine circuitry in the ventral tegmental area, basically. This is the ventral striatum, which is the nucleus accumbens, the reward and salient system. And here is the hippocampus. And you can see that the ultra-high risk group has a much different wiring intensity or connectivity in this circuitry than the control group. And furthermore, the intensity of the wiring, the connectivity, correlates with the degree of abnormal belief present in the ultra-high risk group. Now, these are folks that have not been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder as yet, but for clinical reasons have been found to be at high risk. So this brings us to the end of our whirlwind tour. If we reflect briefly on this, we can see that breakthroughs are being made in the microcircuitry of the cortex in perhaps identifying the algorithm that the cortex uses in computing. And we can see the emerging applications in solving riddles in neuroscience, in the uh, control of affect, thought, the predictive brain and some applications in borderline personality disorder as well as schizophrenia. The most hopeful aspect though, and while I'm talking to you about this, you will hear some music in the background, a piece that is played uh, every year at the uh, New Year's Day concert of the Vienna Philharmonic, the Blue Danube Waltz. And its soothing melody should get us into the new year with a hopefully renewed sense of hope that we might be discovering technologies that will give us an increased sense of peace based on the science, validated for science, and perhaps changing how we can deal with each other and how we can take care of this planet. Prozit Neuer, have a wonderful new year. We'll see you again soon at Behavioral Health 2000.